Okay, so welcome everyone to the webinar with our special guests. Um, we have Sheng Dirk, who was originally from the Netherlands, and we have Malcolm Bellman, who is from Australian Capital Territory. Um, so welcome everyone who hasn't been to a Fair Vote Canada webinar before. What we usually do in these webinars is I give each of our guests about 15 or 20 minutes to talk and um, share some of their experience. And then after they've both made their presentations, then I open it up to questions. And the way you can ask questions is you should have a chat box or a question box, and you can be typing your questions for Malcolm and Shang in there. And then when we get to the end of the presentations, I will read out the questions and we will answer as many as we can. So the first thing I wanna do is make sure that everybody can see us and hear us. So can people just put uh, yes, if you can see and hear us? Yes, okay, excellent. Okay, thank you. That saves everybody a lot of grief later. Okay, all right, so our first guest tonight uh, is Malcolm Bellman, and Malcolm is going to talk to us about how the voting system works in Tasmania. And I'm going to read you Malcolm's uh, biography, and he will share a little bit more about, uh, about himself with you guys as well. So Malcolm is an Australian with over 20 years of professional experience working in and around legislatures and at the public sector, at the federal, state, and local government level in Australia. So he's worked as an advisor to an independent MLA, as a senior advisor and chief of staff to an independent minister for health, community care, housing and corrections, and as a Victorian state public servant. And he is going to talk about uh, PRSTV, which is a proportional representation by the single transferable vote. So I'll let you get started. And uh, Sheng and I will just turn off our webcams for now while Malcolm's doing his presentation. Over to you, Malcolm. Thank you, Anita. Um, hello, friends in Canada. Um, it's interesting to talk to you at this time because particularly in BC, you're going through a process of reform. Um, also, it's fascinating to me that in the last couple of years, there's a blossoming of variations of STV and MMP and other voting systems coming out of Canada. Um, it's an interesting and vibrant time. I'm going to talk to you about Tasmania mostly. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through a brief history of how STV voting came to Tasmania and to the rest of Australia. Then I'll run through a technical description of how it's conducted in Tasmania as briskly as I can. I'll try and balance how much detail I think is worth putting in in the time available. You can ask more questions later on. Um, then I'll give you the news because only 36 hours ago the election result in Tasmania came through. And then I want to talk about how government formation occurs with this kind of system because if you move to a proportional system of any kind you'll face similar challenges. By way of background, I'm sure you know Australia and Canada have virtually identical um, main constitutional structures about the system of responsible government. So, um, the history. I won't take too long, but there's some characters here that are interesting and relevant and it does have connections to Canadian history. Uh, STV is about to reach its 200th year. The very earliest forms of quota, quota voting have their origins in Birmingham in about 1819. Um, the guy who invented that uh, gave the idea to his son, who was a colonial official in London, who got it used in the 1840s for one election in Adelaide. Um, that official's daughter, Catherine Spence, was watching, and Catherine Spence goes on to become one of the most interesting and important Australians of the second half of the 19th century, and a reformer calling for proportional representation. Catherine Spence ends up in Chicago, of all places, in 1893, giving a speech at the exhibition there, in what became the foundation of the Proportional Representation League of Canada and the United States. Going back a bit, an Englishman named Thomas Hare has invented the main mechanics of STV voting in the 1850s. Britain went through a couple of attempts to engage that in, into a form of their election to the House of Commons in the 1860s and the 1880s. It then migrated to Australia, where as we formed the debate leading up to Federation, we were very interested in this alternative way of electing Parliament. Um, the Attorney General of Tasmania, a man named Andrew Inglis Clark, who was basically the writer of the first draft of the Australian Constitution, pushes for STV voting to be used um, in Australian elections in the first of our uh, Federation conventions in 1891. That doesn't work, but as he's the Attorney General of Tasmania, he gets to write the electoral system in Tasmania, and he caused STV voting to be first used in the cities of Hobart and Launceston in 1897. 
They then repealed it and it came back in 1907 and was first used fully across the whole island in 1909. It has been used ever since for 110 years. So that makes it probably the longest, it's certainly the first SDV system in the world and it's probably the longest lasting unchanged proportional representation system anywhere, depending on how long you count the system in Belgium. Um, the system has also propagated to other parts of Australia. In the, 18, in the 1970s and 80s, we started copying it for the upper houses of our legislatures. Unlike Canada, almost all the Australian states and territories have two, le two legislatures. And we've got into the habit that the upper house is elected by STV proportional representation and the lower house by single member division preferential voting, what you call AV. Um, some variations on that theme. We don't have any party list systems in Australia or any of MMP or variations of party list systems. Right, so moving on to a technical description of Tasmania. Um, firstly, recall that in Australia we have compulsory enrolment or registration and we have compulsory voting. Uh, it's estimated that 96% of all possible eligible voters are enrolled and the turnouts at election campaigns are usually about 90, 92%. So we have among the highest electoral participation rates in the world for those reasons. It's important to bear that in mind. It means that turnout is not a factor in Australian elections. Everybody virtually turns out. And those who don't are usually the 18 and 19 year olds. So uh, it's, it's, it's irrelevant to most political campaigns how many people turn out, virtually everybody does. Tasmania has five electoral divisions and these actually date from 1909. They haven't been changed except for the marginal adjustments of the boundaries to cope with population variations, but it's been incredibly consistent for over 110 years. Only three times have they even changed the names of these electoral divisions, and each time they've given them a first letter so that the alphabetical order of these five divisions never changes. There's an incredible stability about what they do in Tasmania. Now, the political parties in Australia, in case you don't know, it's largely a two-party system. There's the Labor Party and the Liberal Party. Early in the 20th century, the Liberal Party had a slightly different name. Uh, Labor is clearly our centre-left Social Democrat Party. The Liberal Party is a merger of Liberal and Conservative political instincts, quite similar, I think, to the Liberal Party of BC, uh, but not identical to the Liberal Party of the rest of Canada. When uh, the elections come around in Tasmania every four years, uh, the five electoral divisions each elect five members. So what happens is that each party, each large party, the Liberals, Labor, and the Greens will nominate five candidates in each of the five electoral divisions. Um, other minor parties or independents will also be nominated. Uh, you are allowed to nominate more than five, and in this election just passed, Labor nominated six candidates in one seat. There's no particular penalty for doing so because the preferential voting system doesn't mean your vote is now being divided by six instead of five or anything. Uh, but nominating more candidates than is necessary um, is also useful because when casual vacancies occur mid-term, the process of filling the casual vacancy is to count back the ballots from the preceding election and pick the next most successful candidate who didn't get elected, they become the new member. Uh, the ballot papers used in Tasmania are essentially pretty much uh, an A4 sheet landscape size. And it's a matrix, there'll be a column for each party and the five candidates or, or fewer will be on the thing. And then the last column is for the ungrouped independents. Each candidate will have a box next to their name and the voter simply fills in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, et cetera, so long as they want, um, indicating their ranking preference for all the candidates. They, it's perfectly acceptable to move between parties, one there, two there, three there, back four there, that's fine. What you tend to see sometimes is that the better known party leaders for each party get a lot of number one votes in the electoral division in which they run, um, but the subsequent second, third, fourth preferences don't necessarily follow their party's order. If those individuals were very well known and popular, that can happen. Um, the ballot papers also use a technique called Robson rotation. The parties can't dictate what order the five candidates appear on in the ballot paper. Um, it's randomised and there are multiple different variants of the ballot paper. So each one of us who goes into the polling place might get uh, a ballot paper with a different ranked uh, ordering of the candidates down the list. So no one gets the advantage of being at the top of the list. It's not a party list system. Whoever's at the top of the list, even if it's a party leader, doesn't get any favouritism. It's entirely up to the voters what individuals they prefer. Uh, we also uh, allow postal ballots and pre-poll voting, and that can sometimes delay election results. Uh, so the election here in Tasmania, or there in Tasmania, was on Saturday night. It will take another week for the last four or five percent of ballots to come in. 
Now, the way the counting works is that there's a quota, and the quota is one sixth, five plus one, one sixth of the votes cast in each electoral division. So each candidate needs to achieve that quota to get elected. Uh, whenever a candidate achieves that quota of votes or goes above it, the surplus is then transferred using the second, third or fourth preferences to other candidates, those who still haven't been elected themselves or haven't been eliminated. Um, when full quotas have been used up and we haven't got five members elected yet, you start eliminating the candidates with the lowest number of votes and those ballots transfer upwards to remaining candidates that are still not being eliminated or elected. And at the end of the process, you get five successful winners. It's possible you only get four, in which case the last fifth and sixth candidates standing, if neither of them have got a quota, the highest one gets the last seat. Okay, um, there's a couple of other technical aspects to how those transfers happen, but I'm not going to go into them here because they're time consuming and they're a bit policy wonkish. Um, I would note that they are sometimes uh, used to accuse STV of being complicated. I'm going to come back to the concept of complicated electoral systems later on. All electoral systems have some complications, but I'm going to argue that STV allows voters to do something very simple. They don't have to think about tactical voting. They don't have to think about electoral boundaries and gerrymandering, all those kinds of problems. All they need to do is show up, see a large amount of choice of options of candidates, choose the ones they like and rank them. I think that that's one way of saying we're making it simple for the vote. Come back to that issue later on. Right, the news, what happened in Tasmania on Saturday? For the preceding term, uh, our Liberal Party was in government and it had won 15 out of 25 of the seats at the preceding election. That's a relative landslide in Tasmanian terms. Uh, Labor had seven and the Greens only three. Uh, going into this election, they were a pretty scandal-free government, popular premier, all the polls indicated they're probably safe for re-election. But there was a bit of a scare in December when some polling indicated that the Labor Party and Liberal Party were quite close together. Um, what this tends to do in Tasmania is cause a bit of a panic about the role of the Greens having the balance of power. Um, the Greens have traditionally supported Labor on most occasions, um, but just as the Greens probably have their highest vote in Australia in Tasmania, there's also a very strong sense in Tasmania of people who don't like the Greens and don't want them having a role in government. So if an election, if the polls indicate that things are close, that becomes the dynamic. The Liberal Party was arguing, as it traditionally does, um, You've got to vote for us, otherwise there'll be this Greens Labor hybrid government. Um, that's pretty much been the political dynamic there for about the last 20 years. Uh, so on the night, uh, we had about 84% of the enrolled electorates votes counted. It's probably going to end up at about 90, 91%, as I said earlier. So that last five or 6% will be postal votes, any pre-poll votes that haven't been counted, um, and any checking or any polling booths that came in a little bit late and so on like that. But at 84%, pretty much done and dusted, and it allows everyone to predict what's going to happen. Um, the, other, the observers are calling essentially 23 out of 25 of the seats. The Liberal Party there will win a majority of 13, down from 15. Um, Labor's improved its position to probably 10 seats. The Greens have had an unusually bad election. They've fallen down to only 10% of the vote. They usually do considerably better. They've only got one certain seat, and there's two seats left to be decided one of which is a battle between Labor and the Greens in one electorate, and the other one is a battle between uh, Liberal and the Greens in another electorate. So the Greens could get as high as three, but it won't matter for government purposes. There's a majority, and it, that majority may in fact grow by one, depending on the counting. Um, and now moving on to government formation, which is of course the result of all of this. Um, as I said, just like Canada, Canada's legislative assemblies, we've got a system of responsible government. It doesn't require a constructive vote to become the government. You actually, it's the negative. You have to be voted out. What happened in British Columbia at the last election last year was a really clear example of how that process works for those of you in British Columbia. Um, in Tasmania, two thirds of the 34 elections since 1909, they haven't produced minority governments, they've produced majority governments. Having said that, the history of Australia is largely the history of these two dominant parties. The interesting variations have mostly come in the last 25 years with the rise of the Greens and other minor parties in Australia. Um, there were two occasions in the 1950s when the Assembly had 30 members where there was a tie on 15 seats each. Um, so they held a new election 12 months later and the same result happened. And it actually led to them increasing the size of the Assembly from 30 to 35, so they had an odd number. Uh, later on in the 1980s, during one of the occasions when the Greens were doing very well, Liberal and Labor actually voted together to shrink the House of Assembly back down from 35 to its current 25 members. There's no doubt why they did it, it was specifically to get rid of as many Green members as they possibly could. 
Um, and so that that has made it harder for the Greens in the original 35 minute 35 member system. Um, in 1989, there was a Labor minority government and it started this process of angst about the role of the Greens in the system. Um, in 1996, Labor again had a major minority opportunity with the Greens, but they refused to deal with them. So the Liberal Party came in and ran a minority. Then in 2010, the same situation uh, occurred as 89. There were Surprisingly, there were 10 Liberals, 10 Labor and five Greens, quite an inconvenient situation by some standard. After a couple of weeks of constitutional mucking around, Labor and the Greens formed an accord and formed a coalition government for four years. Uh, it was stable in its own terms. It certainly didn't end early and it didn't result, involve particularly much acrimony over policy, at least between the members of the cabinet. Uh, but uh, when it was done, there was a landslide at the following election to the Liberal Party. The Tasmanian electorate, as I said, is simultaneously has the highest support for the Greens and the highest dislike of the Greens. Um, and that dislike of, coal of coalition governments involving the Greens is, exists within the Labor Party's base as well. So there's a lot of Labor voters who don't want it, their party to form an alliance with the Greens. OK, I'm going to wind up in a moment, but uh, there's a few observations I want to make about it, all of this, about what, what it is that voters seem to want out of the system. Um, it's clear, not just in Tasmania, but in other Australian dynamics, the voters want choice. They like being given a range of candidates to choose amongst. They certainly like being given options within political parties of who to choose amongst. We'd probably rebel if anyone attempted to change the system so that we didn't have that degree of choice. We also clearly like a direct vote for the individual candidates. As I said, there's only one very brief usage of the party list approach to elections in Australia. It was in South Australia in the 1970s, I think, um, and it was immediately repealed after one usage. We don't do party lists in the country. And I think part of, part of the reason of that is we have a very strong sentiment of wanting to actually sort of grab the candidate by the lapel and make sure that we have an accountable relationship with that. I think that's true of Canada as well. Although obviously some political reformers in Canada are talking about the party list and the MMP options. Um, the impact of the federal system also needs to be taken into account. So long as there's two strong dominant major parties at the federal level, it's unlikely that you will see diversification of the parties running at the state level because it's the same state branches that run elections. I think that's a little bit different to what happens in Canada, where you do have different party makeups between British Columbia and Alberta and the maritime states, and obviously Quebec's different again. Um, whereas in Australia, the, the main dominance of the two major parties uniformly across the country, um, in some states, the Liberal Party is in alliance with a rural party called the National Party, but that coalition is still essentially the right, the centre-right party in Australia. Um, it's, or, uh, there's a few other things that maybe better come up in, in question time, but the impact of all of this on governance, the more diverse the parliament you have, the harder it is for lobbyists and their interests to win control of the debates and what goes on on the floor. Um, an artificial majority, um, my opinions obviously, generated from a single member electoral system, produces a, always produces a government with a majority. The alternative is always going to get a majority if it gets in. It makes it easier for lobbying interests to um, put it crudely, to buy the support they need of government for the policies they want. A diverse parliament with more possibility of individual members simply not agreeing with the party line and so on, I think has a significant benefits for the nature of governance. Um, do proportional systems overrepresent extremists? Well, there are some things going on in Europe at the moment where the reasonably extreme, by our terms, I suppose, political parties are getting a go. This is a judgment call. Is it better to have these extremists inside your political system, possibly mutating and moder moderating their behaviour and their policies, or should they be left on the outside uh, with their supporters simply becoming angry and further frustrated with the political system? We know in our countries that voters are pretty frustrated with the quality of our political parties and the system anyway. Um, another aspect of the reason why I believe it's good to keep uh, a direct election of individual candidates is that we know that voters don't like party hacks. Uh, the kind of career member who has done nothing else but work as a staffer for a political party and then eventually they get a position. Um, there's a pretty strong sense in Australia in which if that's been your history, you don't, you don't advertise that at election time. Um, independents get up quite frequently in Australia, particularly in New South Wales and Queensland, the one from Tasmania as well at the moment. Um, and what voters seem to be looking for is that individual ability to think outside the party line, the party dogma, 
my sense is that independents aren't quite so common in Canada. Um, and then finally, I'd like to come back to this issue of complexity, which I know has been kicked around a lot about STV in British Columbia. Um, I think that there should be a strong distinction between how complex something is for the voter and how complex something is for the administrators of the election. All electoral systems require a lot of back office work. The party list systems do, the STV system do to handle all the transfers at the vote counting stage and so on. Um, but that's different from how easy it is for the voter to handle the electoral system. As I said, it is, it is, it is a natural thing to do to have a small list of candidates that you like and to be able to rank them in order. If on the other hand, you're using first past the post, you have to choose just one. You have to have some context to the whole political situation of the time to know whether your vote would be wasted. And maybe you have to consider tactical voting, but you can't possibly have enough information to decide what's right and wrong. Um, you have to worry about where the electoral district boundaries are and they get changed from time to time. And if you live in the United States, they get gerrymandered. That's complexity. Um, you have to actually watch parliaments come into existence afterwards where you may not actually have a representative for your local area that does any of the things that you would like a representative to do for you and perhaps votes for all the policies that you personally oppose to. So you are denied in that circumstance the opportunity to even really be represented effectively in Parliament. That's complication. What I would suggest to you is that what's happening in Tasmania, um, the same system that operates in the ACT where I'm standing right now, um, is that you actually have the simplicity of knowing that all you need to do is decide what candidates you support. The counting process works. 80 to 85 percent of the voters end up with someone in Parliament they can point to saying I voted for them if not first preference and at least another fairly high one and I feel represented by them and you get actual representative assemblies. It's supposed to be a system of representative and responsible government that means an executive has to be responsible to a legislature that is representative. If the latter is not true it's not what the constitutions of Australia and Canada are meant to be creating. All right, Anita, I'm going to stop on that note and either hand over to Zeng or take questions. It's entirely up to you. All right, thanks a lot, Malcolm. Okay, so I'm going to let um, I'm going to let Sheng come on for a while. And for those of you, I I forgot to introduce myself. I'm sure everybody on this webinar probably knows who I am. I'm Anita, them, the acting executive director of Fair Vote Canada. Um, so now I'm going to introduce Sheng. Um, so Sheng is, uh, is a resident of BC for quite a long time now, and he's active in the referendum campaign going on right now. But he's originally from Holland. Um, and in Holland, they use a form of list PR, which he can tell you more about. And he's also been very active in various capacities in BC um, during the federal and provincial elections. He's been a deputy returning officer. He's run for the Green Party. And uh, yeah, and he's going to talk to us about how elections work for voters in the Netherlands. All right, go ahead, Shane. All right, can everybody, can you see my screen? I hope you can. So this is a map of Holland. It has a geography of 41,500 kilometers, which means that it fits into Canada about 250 times give or take a few windmills, tulips, and wooden shoes. I put a little map of Canada right there in the bottom left corner so you can see how it compares to Canada. It's tiny. And one-fifth of what you see there is water, and 30% of the country lies below sea level. The Dutch have been building dikes since the 700s, and in the 1500s, they started to pump out water with these, these marquee windmills. And they continue to pump out water to this day, every day, because if they don't, they'll all drown. Even though 17 million people are crowded together on that postage stamp of a country, believe it or not, they are the second largest exporter of agricultural good, goods in the world. The seventh richest country in gross national product per person and their fourth, fourth on the UN Index of Human Development. Canada was number one on that list in the 90s, but we've been slipping and now we're just number 10. But isn't it incredible that the Dutch achieved all those great things while wearing wooden shoes and having a finger in a dike? The Dutch also like bicycling. They like it a lot. They 
don't wear wooden shoes in company anymore, but now they build wooden bicycles. Their premier, Mark Rutte, likes to ride his bicycle to work too. In this picture, you can see him lock his bike. That's important because a lot of bicycles are stolen in Holland. Then he's off to see the king. There are in fact more bicycles in Holland than people. And the average Dutch person rides more than a thousand kilometers per year, except for teenagers. They ride an average of 2000 kilometers per year. That is if they can find their bike in the parking lot. And if it gets slippery, the Dutch don't ride their bicycles. They all go skating together. They really like skating too. The Dutch system of democracy, I'm getting around to it now, started in the 1400s when their first Staten General or Parliament was formed. It was a permanent council, council of royalties and the rich of 17 separate fiefdoms at the time. The famous William of Orange, who fought the Spanish occupation during their 80 year war, was a Stadthouder, head of government. Here he is. It was effectively hereditary right from the start, but Holland didn't become an official monarchy until 1813, and that was at the end of another lengthy occupation they had to endure, this time by the French under Napoleon. And here's their first official king, Koning Willem I. At that time, the, in 1848, the government was also split in two chambers, what we have in Canada too. They had a commons and they had a senate. The senate was appointed by the king and the second chamber represented the regions and uh, they were elected by the 1,000 male taxpayers who paid the most taxes who lived in the regions. Legislation had to be passed in both chambers as it still does today, which effectively gave the king veto power. That however, ended in 1848 when the revolutions were raging all over Europe and the king accepted a new constitution which removed his right to appoint senators. And with that, Holland became the constitutional monarchy which is still as today, where the royalty has mostly a symbolic and ceremonial function. Here is the current king and his family. They like bicycling too. In 1918, Holland changed from first past the post to their current system, a party list PR system, and since 1919, women are allowed to vote. Some political scientists call the Dutch system a partycracy, a rule by political parties, and that seems quite apt. Voters have a wide variety of choice, but it's a choice between social, political, economic philosophies rather than a choice between individual candidates or where they're from. Parties have their own internal mechanisms to elect or appoint candidates on their party lists. And while it's formally an open list system, which means that Dutch voters can vote for an individual candidate on the party list, most voters don't. They just vote for the party they like best. And if a party gets enough votes for 10 seats in the parliament, the top 10 listed candidates almost are always the ones who get those seats. To give you an idea of what it's like for voters, this is what the ballot looked like in last year's election. Lots and lots of choice. It's a newspaper sized ballot. Perhaps a little too much choice. But remember, they don't have to vote strategically. There's no gerrymandering. It's all open and they're used to it. One of those candidates on that list was Geert Wilders, of course. The whole world is scared of Geert Wilders. They call him the Dutch Trump. Maybe that's because Wilders wants to close the borders to Muslim immigrants, shut down all mosques, ban sales of the Quran, and leave the European Union. But you have to admit that his hairdos and uh, Trumps are pretty similar. In this picture, you got to can see who is who there. The Dutch, contrary to everybody else, are not very scared of Wilders. Even 13% of them even voted for him. But they did that while knowing that the other political parties find Wilders a little bit too much. And nobody wants to work with him in government. 
and they know that their premier Rutte will beat Wilders every time in their blowpipe contests. Top of that, Wilders looks pretty uncomfortable on the bicycle, so pff, forget him. There's 150 members in the second chamber, the House of Commons. In the election last year, and there's no compulsory voting in Holland, but still 80% of eligible voters participated. A dizzying 20, 80 par 28 political parties were running, and 13 parties now have representation in the Commons, and that's a near record. That includes five seats for my favorite party, the Party for the Animals. And while you may think that it's silly to have a party for the animals, but half the wild animals have disappeared in the last 40 years, we're facing massive overfishing, climate change, pollution, and disgusting cruelty in our factory farms. Perhaps a political party focused on animal welfare is not such a bad idea. You be the judge. The lack of a threshold in the Dutch system means that just 0.7% of the votes will get you a seat in Parliament. And you'd think that having so many different parties in Parliament would make their system inherently unstable, but the evidence doesn't support that at all. Since the Second World War, there have been 22 elections in Holland, and that's exactly the same number of elections we've had in Canada during that time. The last Dutch election was held in March of last year, and it took seven months to form the current coalition government of four political parties. Germany just went through something like that too, and they have a government now, as of today, in fact. Did that long wait upset the Dutch? Well, some were pretty annoyed by it, of course, but a lot of voters also realized that they had given their politicians a tricky task by voting for so many little parties and they trusted it would all work out in the end. You know why? Because it always works out in the end. During the so-called formation periods between governments, the previous government simply keeps on governing. The economy and the tulips keep growing, kids go to school, the trains run reasonably on time, etc., etc. Life goes on and there's nothing to get too terribly upset about. When I moved to Canada in 1982, I have to say I was truly shocked when I saw the Canadian Parliament in action. Politicians just yelling at each other, nobody listening. They didn't have real questions. They were just looking for a gotcha moment and they didn't answer questions either. They were just repeating talking points with someone in a back room who nobody voted for, by the way, had given, them, given to them. Politicians were supposed to represent the region in which they were elected, but in reality, they just spouted the party line. Perhaps the difference in the rooms in which our legislators meet tells the story of the difference of our political cultures. This looks like a room built for hyper-partisan, confrontational, polarized politics. On the other hand, here's a room, circular, built for reasoned debate and finding common ground on the, uh, uh, for uh, the best of everybody. Then, after all that, I learned that half the votes in Canada don't count and that 39% of our votes gives one political party all the power. How can that make any sense? So, do I think that Canada should adopt a list PR system like they have in Holland? Absolutely not. The Dutch system of democracy has many strengths and it works quite well for them because of their tiny geography, their seven centuries long shared history of battles against water and foreign invaders and their strong common Dutch cultural identity. Canada, however, is the second largest country in the world with a young history, which we're working on reconciling and we're not a monocultural, but a multicultural country. There are not two countries in the world with identical electoral systems. And while we can learn from looking at others, Canada is unique in its size, history, culture, and its extremely unevenly dispersed population. And when we finally move to a proportional system, and we will, those unique challenges will require a unique made in Canada, made for Canada electoral system. And that's all I have to say.
back to you, Anita, if you're there. Okay. All right. So I hope everybody found that as interesting as I did. Two very different countries, um, very different experiences with proportional representation. So, I mean, if there's one takeaway you can get from that, it's when opponents or proponents say to you, well, proportional representation means this. You can see that it's very much um, related to the culture of the country and the electoral system that they have and the history of the country, but there are some, some commonalities. Okay, so I'm going to uh, go through a few questions that people had. So I'll start with the one that uh, there was a couple that people emailed in. So somebody wanted to know, uh, they're worried about lists of party hacks. So this is one of the opponent talking points is that with PR, you'll just get lists of people appointed by parties. Do you want to re reflect on that? Well, in Holland, that's certainly the case. It is, uh, there is, uh, politicians tend to be in, in politics for, for quite a while. Uh, there's advantages to that, of course. You do get people who have experience in governing, in, in policy making, uh, in, in finding agreement with others. There's disadvantages too, because, yeah, there is, you lack that, that direct connection uh, between people. The other hand, of course, um, uh, people don't have to vote for your party. Uh, if you put people on there they don't like, or if you only put men with gray hair on your list, people will not vote for you. So you get a variety. It's partially party hacks, but it's also, uh, you know, all politicians depend on votes, and, and our votes mean that we have to do what, what people want us to be. Malcolm? Um, obviously, as I said, we don't use party list systems here in Australia. But even the systems we, we, we do use for STV um, can be bastardised to some extent. And the pure ones are the ones in use in Tasmania and the Australian Capital Territory, where, as I described earlier, there's the voter can choose whichever one of the candidates they want and they can skip between party columns in order, organising their rankings. The way we do it to elect the Senate and a couple of the state upper houses looks the same at first glance. Uh, except that the parties set a certain order and there's an option to tick a box above the main matrix and just say, I want to vote for the Liberal Party. And if you tick that box, what happens is that it's treated as one, two, three, four, five down the party list um, or the order that appears on the ballot paper, I should say more accurately. And what that does is it makes those versions of STV behave very similarly to the party list as Sheng's described and as the other systems in Europe and around the world use party of the system. And so if you're going to get three senators for the Liberal Party elected, um, you know exactly it'll be that one, then that one, then that one. There's, I think, one instance of the Tasmanian population bucking the order of a column of Labor senators elected and lifting number five up to fourth place and getting that person elected. One instance since this above the line voting option was brought in in the 1980s. Um, technical wonks like me hate it. And it was modified a little bit two years ago and it's not as bad as it was uh, but it's really important to know what the nomination rules are in an electoral system because even though you think you might have a system that is very pro-voter choice legislators have this habit of finding ways of, that the nomination system also becomes important needless to say parties only nominate whoever they want and if they choose to nominate a series of unpopular individuals but they know perfectly well they're going to get enough votes to get about three of them in there's not a lot you can do about that under any electoral system, except, as Sheng said, just walk away from them altogether. Um, and I think one of the curious strengths of the Dutch system is at least you have an enormous amount of choice of parties, even if you don't have choices of individuals. Sheng, I found that interesting that um, in the Netherlands, it's sort of, it's a, like a flexible list system. So you can, it's a little bit like Malcolm was describing, um, you know, where you can vote for the, an individual if you want, or you can just tick the party. And it's, I found that intriguing that most people just tick the party. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. Similar to what Malcolm says, similar to what ha happens in Tasmania. People just, uh, they have the party they like, and that's the party they want to vote for. And, you know, they trust that whoever put the party put up will be good in, in, in representing them, that view. 
So it's worth mentioning that the models that are on the table for BC and endorsed by um, the different electoral reform organizations for serious consideration don't actually look like that. They're either models like STV where uh, it's candidate centered and you rank individuals across party lines in any order you choose. So this whole thing of the party list becomes irrelevant or it's an open list where the order of the candidates on the party's list makes absolutely no difference. There's no option to just tick a party. So we're, I think that's sort of what Malcolm was talking about where we have that tradition in Canada where um, you know, people want to feel like they're voting for individuals. You know, even if in the end it ends up being proportional for parties, and that's their main concern is that it's proportional for parties. In the process to get there, they want to have that choice. So I've got a couple of questions about extremists here. So a lot of the things we're hearing from opponents are basically if we get PR, we're going to elect uh, hateful racists. Anybody want to address that? Well, I think Mal Malcolm already talked a little bit about that, but you, know, you might be better off with having those extremists inside your parliament uh, than outside. As a, a German friend of mine said, you know, these used to be thugs outside beating up people. Now they have to wear a suit and a tie and they have to actually talk with people. You know, it's much, much better that way. Um, there is you no, know, Europe has gone through a gigantic wave of uh, refugees and people are concerned about that and some people just want to stop it and yeah you can either suppress those views um or you can allow them to be to be expressed and uh and you can argue which one's best my, my preference is to to have them heard and to deal with them and um and um because that's what democracy is about you know about hearing all kinds of voices and making decisions based upon on all those voices I'd make another observation that um, if we imagine that a small wedge of the voters, let's call it 5% or 10%, are going to take um, extremists, and I think that's a loaded term, but are going to take the views outside the mainstream on an issue. Um, if they get their 5% of seats in an assembly, but can't do very much with it, uh, at least their voices are going to get heard, which is fair, um, but they're not likely to be in government, as the Wilders is not in government in Holland, because as Deng said, the other parties will simply find a way of binding coalitions that don't involve it group. In Australia, that sentiment um, doesn't run separately. It finds its way inside one of the mainstream political parties. And while I don't think that either of our two main parties um, are, are particularly politically extreme, uh, what you do tend to find is that the only channel for that view is to start trying to take over the branches of a major party and try and, trying to get those more extreme views to become the party policy. In which case, a view that may only represent a small proportion of the population is now capable of magnifying its in impact if it happens to be inside the party that's in government. Um, we've seen a lot of strained debates in the last couple of years about same-sex marriage in Australia, where we knew that 75 or 80 percent of the population was completely comfortable with moving to a system which permitted that. Um, the Liberal Party was in government federally. It had a large wedge of its back bench that were very socially conservative, and they were vetoing movement on the issue, even to the extent of vetoing the matter really being debated in Parliament. So there are ways in which very minority, minorities are a better word than extreme in some of these ways, um, viewpoints can exaggerate their influence um, under the single member electorate system. And then you it depends on parliamentary procedure. I mean, we, we agonise a lot about electoral systems, but one of the other realities of what comes out of our parliaments is their internal practices. If we move to systems where even the party and government couldn't veto matters being brought up for debate and vote, if we move to systems where patient processes of committees were able to put forward bills, even if they were bills that the government of the day didn't want to see put forward, we would create more democratic outcomes even with the same electoral system. Yes, and if you allow extremists to climb up through parties, you may end up with something like Trump. Who wants Trump? Yeah. Well, that was the primary voters that did that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, another question is about, and this has been touched on already, about lobbyists. So um, 
Malcolm, the leaders of the No campaign in BC, uh, by some not coincidence, are paid lobbyists. <laughs> so I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit more about what the difference would be for why are professional lobbyists so opposed to proportional representation? What difference does it really make in terms of their influence on politicians okay, and give, policy? I'll give two answers. One, just an observation. Um, the only people who intensely defend first past the post are politicians who already hold a seat elected under that system and lobbyists. No, there is no grassroots movement for first past the post. Of course, they'll run a whole bunch of media arguments to suggest that the alternatives are unstable and yada, 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 and look around the world and you can see that's not true. But the only people who defend first past the post are those kinds of people. I would suggest, and this is to put it fairly crudely, that the reason why lobbyists and industries who want favours out of parliaments like first past the post is because it makes buying governments cheaper. It is very hard, difficult in policy and difficult in politics to buy up three or four parties simultaneously with different viewpoints, just with lobbying and cash and donations. It is relatively easy to buy one large party, especially if you've trapped it in a, a, a gameplay with another large party which you also purchase by donating to them. Um, and we do see industries, frankly, the banking sector, the gambling sector, which donate equally to both parties in Australia. Not because one or other of them was their ideological favourite party. It's just buying both of them to veto change to the law so that its current conditions continue. Um, first past the post, single member electric systems, including AV, um, therefore create a system which is cheaper to buy. Okay, so I want to just back up a bit for anybody on the webinar that isn't aware of this. So at the national level in Australia, they have a winner take all system, alternative vote, which is a single member system, just like first, it's very similar to first past the post. And that's the one that Justin Trudeau was uh, basically vetoed the entire electoral reform project if he couldn't have that particular system. So, you know, Malcolm, can you reflect on the difference for lobbyists lobbying a government elected by AV as opposed to maybe what you see in Tasmania? Is there any difference? Um, AV and first past the post are no different from these purposes. We've been using what you call AV for most of our parliamentary chambers since the 1920s. Don't adopt it yourself. It's, I would say that in a score out of 10, first past the post is worth two and AV is worth four. There are lots of other electoral systems worth six, eight or nine. Um, if you have a binary choice, AV is better than first past the post, but it's nothing to write home about. Um, as far as these issues of how easy it is to influence a government are concerned, the two AV and first past the post were essentially identical. The single member electric system creates the same political dynamics. All that AV does is that in 10% of the seats, you'll get a slightly fairer outcome if there were three or more candidates. Political roles are not generally the same. With um, proportional or STV or any other proportional system, the lobbying is harder as we've been discussing. Having said that, um, the Tasmanian election I was just reporting on a few minutes ago, Tasmania has um, a large presence of poker machines in hotels and pubs. And the Labor Party opposition took a policy to get rid of that, to not renew the licenses. And in response, the gambling industry is alleged to have dumped five million bucks into the campaign. That's an enormous sum of money by Tasmanian standards. It's only 400,000 people. Um, so if you really, really want to defend your industry, you can find a way under any electoral system except in the state of New South Wales in Australia, where donations from certain classes, property developers, the gambling industry and so on, have been banned. And I would recommend that you do that, and that that is um, far more significant than the exact design of the electoral system as far as purchasing interest is, influence is concerned. Right. So they've just done that in BC. They've banned corporate and union donations. Good. Good. Yeah. Good. Okay. And capped individual donations at, I think, around $1,500 or so. New South Wales does that. The rest of the country is a long way behind. There's a debate at the federal level about doing something. I don't think they'll move on the issue. Shane, how does it work for lobbyists in the Netherlands? How do you possibly lobby a government that's made up of four different parties? Well, yeah, there's there's that, um, and there's of course the part. It, it's it's parliamentary 
activities are completely different. Uh, it, it's not always the governing parties that vote for uh, legislation. Sometimes one of the parties votes against, or one of the governing parties will vote against legislation and one of the other parties in opposition will vote in favor of it. So lobbying is it make, makes it extremely hard because you now have 13 parties in parliament and you how can you how can you possibly lobby 13 different parties uh, ranging from the ultra right to the ultra left to ultra green uh, it's just it's unfathomable so uh, of course there's there's lobbying of ministers uh, but actual no I think we're mostly we don't think we're so much worried about lobbying as in that different viewpoints are heard we're concerned when it becomes influencing unduly with through financial gifts or promises and that's extremely extremely hard under uh, under a PR system with so many parties so in Holland lobbying is not a not a big deal um, so I have a question. Sheng, please recommend one or two PR systems that would be good for Canada and BC. <laughs> that's a that's a dangerous question. I, I I other than other than list PR, I would support any PR system for BC and Canada. I think what we we do want to keep uh, our local representation. Uh, we want proportionality. We want to make sure that rural areas don't lose out. And there's either either a, a, a mixed member system or an STV type system can be made to fit uh, both BC and Canada. So I, I really I'd be fine. Or a mixed system like the rural urban uh, might be uh, might be a good one. I quite like it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's. Uh, Systems, proportional systems are so flexible that that they can be made to fit the, the reality and the, and the geography and the culture of BC and Canada. And there's more than one, more than one good one. So here I have somebody asking Malcolm if he was voting with STV, how it's essentially about strategic voting. He's saying, what would I do to try to stop one candidate from winning with STV? Oh, well, um, in a sense, you can't. If, if you get to choose who you want to go into Parliament, but you're not voting against someone else. So if Gert Wilders was running in an STV campaign and he had a quota of votes, then he'll get a seat. But so he should, because he's got a quota of voters who want him to go to the Parliament. So you don't vote against people. Um, you can fill out the entire ballot all down to the total number of candidates running just for the you know, guilty pleasure of putting somebody last, but it doesn't fairly worth the effort. Um, STV is about choosing who you send to Parliament at an individual level. Um, it's not a system for voting against um, the possible representation of people who have views other than your own. Yep. And can I just can I just pick up on, on the what system to recommend question? Um, I clearly prefer STV, but I'm not an absolutist. I think the reason the reason I like STV is that there are two problems here. One is how to get um, an assembly, a legislature that represents the greatest number of people in the in the electorate to go about the business of passing laws, knowing that those laws will be well representative. The other is to choose an executive. Um, STV solves both problems. The party list proportional systems only really solve the latter problem. Having said that, I think what's going on in Canada is fascinating. There's a lot of creativity coming out of the process, the federal process that failed a year ago and the British Columbian process now. And I, I'm beginning to suspect that any variant of STV that tries to do some of these sort of local biasing to ensure that people from local areas are elected amongst the successful candidates might provide you with a good model, need a little bit of work on the design because the creativity is still a bit young. Um, if you choose MMP or any of the party list systems, and I personally think MMP is really not different fundamentally from the party list systems, you'll still solve the second problem. You'll get a better representative choice of executive governments, but you'll have lost that direct connection with, between the voter and the member of parliament. And all of these systems are better than what you've currently got. And frankly, better than AV as used in Australia as well. So, but with the MMP systems, we can have straight open lists. So yes, there would still be, and they would all be at the regional level. So I wouldn't totally agree with you that you'll lose 
a connection. I think if you're a Green Party voter living in Kamloops, you're going to be happy to have a Green Regional MLA, <laughs> you know, yeah, for your region. If you, if you trust the party and you know that there's going to be one Green get elected under a party list system and you and the voter is prepared to trust the party and doesn't need that individual connection, that's fine. Which is why I'm suggesting, you know, nothing will go wrong in Canada if you choose any of those electoral systems. Your politics will be better than it is now. Um, however, the experience in in the Netherlands and in all the other countries that use open lists is that you still end up pretty much with the exact order of the party gets elected because very few people use the openness in any powerful way. And, and behind all this is, is a fundamental question. Do people want to vote for parties and trust them and do know more about it? Or do people want to maintain that direct connection with the MLA? Um, I think every time you ask someone, they'll say the latter. And yet at the same time in most elections, people do switch off a little bit and they know what party they support and they maybe don't pay too much care. Yeah, on a practical level, people want to vote, say they want to vote for an individual, but the results show that their primary decision-making is by party. So yeah, it's trying to find that made in Canada balance of those two things, right? Yeah. So I have assuming, another question. Assuming they can vote for an individual. Right, yeah, in, in, all the, in all the models on the table, closed lists are not on the table here. People would not yeah, so yeah. tolerate, tolerate it. They don't like that idea, they don't trust parties. We have to build to elect our local and regional people directly, you know? Yeah. We have to have the choice. You know, I understand what you're saying. How much people exercise that choice is another matter, but we have to have the choice. Well, that's right. Even if they, but if, I think this is a design question. Even if people don't use that choice very much, when choosing and designing a system, you should choose one that allows choice. Um, right. Because if you choose one that doesn't allow choice, closed list, party list systems, you've cut off the option of one of the things that, that people, when you ask them and when you engage them in a conversation, they say they want that choice. We know they don't always exercise it. Um, but you shouldn't choose a system that directly contradicts one of the few things that voters are being clear about. And yeah. and you're not clear, you're clearly not going to choose closed list party list system. I think. Nope. Um. So, uh, oh, do you want to talk, Shane? Go ahead. Oh no, no. I just wanted to agree. Uh, uh, I think you no. Know, if we're going to design a system that has to be part of it, because that's what people want, and we if we are going to get another system, it's going to be through a referendum. Uh, so we'd better listen. Um, so I'm hearing somebody asking, and uh, what can we do to, about people who are saying that this will disadvantage people in rural areas? How do you respond to that? I don't know if that's even an issue in the Netherlands or Tasmania being such small countries, but what's your reflections on that? Um, in, in BC, one oh, oh, of the systems... Go ahead, go ahead, Malcolm. Okay, well, we've got more rural areas here, Shane. Um, Firstly, there's no reason why STV or indeed any other large, large district, multi-member district system will do anything difficult for rural members. There'll presumably be districts that represent the rural areas and they'll send a whole bunch of rural MLAs to Parliament. Um, they'll probably have the correct number by population. We wouldn't, we wouldn't breach the rule of representation by population in setting up such a system. So they'll have the right number of rural representatives. In a sense, they're not disadvantaged. Um, and if the rural members end up having some, you know, balance of power influence on certain topics, um, then they'll be able to exercise that influence. And any government that wants to, you know, maintain support out in those regions will choose policies that help those regions economically. Uh, there's no logical reason why rural residency is puts you in any disadvantaged co position compared to any other basis of viewpoint if you're using multi-member system, whether it's STV or the or the party list version. And I'd say, indeed, the opposite. What we have in Australia under the single member system is that our national party, which tends to win about 15 seats in the federal parliament at every election quite consistently, because it's got 15 incredibly safe seats and it doesn't run anywhere else. Um, that's created a wedge that arguably has too much power. Although the national party members, they tend to switch from having very high levels of power when their coalition is in office in government and no power when Labor Party is in office in government. So, you know, that if you think that rural people um, benefit from having their, their members have influence, it swings from 100% to 0% um, as government comes and goes. And I don't think that's particularly useful um, in representing rural. I live, by the way, in a rural area. 
And if you're interested out there are infrastructure and roads and railways and adequate provision for hospitals and things like that, you want these things to be stable over decades, not coming and going with the swing of government. Good point. I think in BC the situation's a little little different because we do have big differences in riding sizes. Uh, the uh, largest riding, the Stikine, has just 16,000 votes voters or so. Uh, the yep. smallest ridings in downtown Vancouver have uh, close to 60,000. So it's almost a oh, factor right. four. Uh, big differences, and that, but that has a reason. It's part of of our Canadian geography and that that unevenly dispersed population. Uh, for people to have equal access to their MLA. Uh, these gigantic areas, you know, the Stikin, the largest riding is four times as large as Holland, the whole country. It's one riding and it's in the north and, and there's very few roads so that MLA has to fly everywhere. Uh, so to, to give people in those ridings equal access to their MLA, that's why there's fewer people uh, in those ridings. And I don't think that any of the proposals for BC uh, on the table right now will change that. We got rid of that disproportionate riding size in the 1980s. In Australia, both at state and federal level, population is strictly used to determine the electoral division boundaries. Um, and very tight variances, 3.5% of federal level. Every, juris, every electoral division has to have a very close number to the average. Um, so in a sense, what we're doing is we're not advantaging rural people by giving them um, bonus influence in parliament. We obviously we have a large amount of same situation as Canada in many ways, a large amount of rural areas that need to have the infrastructure concern. But I would say having worked at multiple levels of government and worked as a state public servant, um, the way you make sure that infrastructure and services are delivered equitably, it doesn't come from parliament. It comes from the way you set up your whole financial system and the, the delivery of services system. We do it, I think, perfectly well in Australia. It's obviously harder and more expensive to provide services in rural areas, um, but we all accept that. The large amount of the road budget is spent in rural areas in Australia because it's quite proportion to population anyway. Um, where we do have rural members with very, very, very large electorates and West Australia has the two biggest electorates in the world, um, we give them more resources. So those, those MLAs can fly about and have more staff recognising the fact of their, their difficulty. Sense. So somebody else has a question asking about um, in the Netherlands and Tasmania, how often do MLAs vote against the party line? Is it, I know it's sort of a separate issue from PR, but people are quite interested in the independence of politicians. Okay. In, in Holland, that is fairly uh, normal to that, that candidates will not always agree with their parties. Uh, and there's there's uh, acceptance of that because if uh, they really don't like what their own party is doing, they just split off and start a new political party, and they will have, <laughs> and they don't lose their seat in parliament. So, so that that almost Stalinist party loyalty that our MLAs and MPs are supposed to have just doesn't exist in Holland. Uh, it is and. Uh, Typical of that too is that there's much more uh, private, many more private member bills, which actually make it to fruition. There was just one which came through, was started by a woman named Pia Dijkstra, female MLA from the D66 party. She started this process back in 2012, and it's about organ donation. In Holland, about 150 people a year die or so because there aren't enough organs available. So she wanted to change the law to, to reverse uh, the the uh, donation law so that you are will be an organ donor unless you uh, uh, say that you don't want to be uh, and there's a process for that so she got it passed in the parliament uh, in in the second chamber uh, a couple of years ago big majority but then it still had to be passed in the senate and in the senate there was opposition to that because people were worried that family members would be upset and somebody had died and they knew that dad wouldn't want to be sliced up and and put into other parts of that part of him puts into other people so there was talk and so the the law was changed now they have it so that 
uh, if family members have strong uh, opposition, strong problem after somebody has died, they can stop that process. That was done, the law passed, and now uh, 150 less people in Holland will die. And I think that's part of the greater, sh uh, shows the greater independence of MLAs to actually represent the people that have voted for them in many ways. And that's sorely, sorely lacking uh, in our current system in Canada. In Australia, party discipline is very strong. I think probably very similar to Canada um, and to Britain. The Labor Party in particular has a very firm rule about members not disobeying a caucus position or they, they're simply disendorsed. Uh, we do get independence in the holding balances of power from time to time and obviously they're completely at liberty. Uh, but on the whole, and the Liberal Party is a little more open about these things. Um, the tradition of both parties is that leaders can declare matters to be conscience votes. There are very few topics on which it's done um, abortion, euthanasia, to some extent, the rights of homosexual people you know, in recent decades, although we made a complete mess of attempting to handle that with gay marriage two years ago, mostly because of delaying tactics by the social conservatives. Uh, but it's very rare to buck party discipline. A little bit more common is for a member to simply walk out and sit as an independent during the middle of a term. No reason, you, legal reason you can't do that. It does happen from time to time. Um, rare on the Labor side, a bit more common on the conservative side. And we also elect independents, and usually independents who get elected to parliament have got a really good voter base because they wouldn't be there otherwise. And they tend, in my opinion, to be quite competent politicians, very good at their grassroots. That's really interesting, Malcolm, because, you know, independents are very rare. And like in, in most, in, well, in, even in most PR systems, but the only exception to that is Ireland that also uses STV. So yeah. I didn't think that we would see the same thing in Tasmania, but apparently you do. So just to kind of, you know, explain to people, right? If you're in a five member district, you need about 16% of the vote. So to that's get right. some of the, one of those seats. So there, if you can get, if you're that popular locally, that 16% of people know and like you, you can get elected as an independent, which is yes, kind of the difference from a party list system. The member in the ACT that I worked for 15 years ago it was exactly that. He was a uh, a popular independent who got re-elected, got elected four times um, because he had a following. Uh, in Tasmania, I think there are no independents at the moment. There is a federal one um, from a single member division who's very popular in the city of Hobart. But again, I would say that one of the advantages of preferential voting, the AV that I don't recommend you take up, is that it does assist, it assists both in sorting out which of the two parties most deserves a seat if there were three or four or five you know, small parties as well. And preferential voting does assist independents to get up because if it's if, if they're popular, but 35, 40%, and they're only facing off against one party, typically in rural areas, it's the national party and a popular local mayor, um, they can get the preferences from everyone else who's sick of the national party and there was a, a trend in northern New South Wales and in Queensland and in some parts of Victoria for that rural independent. And once they get in, they start getting 80% of the vote because they use, the, the local population usually goes, this is a very good thing, and they keep them off in 15 years. So that's an example of PR providing strong local representation <laughs> when you have somebody that's yeah. got elected because they're so connected to... The, those local issues and those local voters. So just to kind of sum up here. If you want to get elected as an independent, you've got to be you've got to be really well connected. And there's no there's nothing no no free nomination from a political party and position on a list is helping you at all. It's it's so, interesting yeah. because one of the key things people are concerned about, you know, is basically your MLA is a fence post who's a salesperson for the party in the riding. Yeah. They don't feel that they're listened to. Um, so, I mean, with any proportional system, you'll have choice of MLAs to go to. But and then there's this other part of it, you know, where Sheng's saying, you know, in Holland, it's the political culture is that they can vote across party lines and work out things in a process of compromise. And Malcolm's saying, well, in, there's strict party discipline um, in Tasmania, but if you are popular enough, you can run as an independent. So... There's a lot more options for politicians and for voters in either scenario. Here we really, if you are not happy 
you don't have, as a politician or a voter, you really don't have very many choices. Can I throw in one more idea? Um, yeah. And to some extent, I hate to say it, but borrowing from the United States primary idea, if we could break up the way parties nominate the list of people, even using SDV system, or using party list system as well, I suppose, with some process by which the public or the members of the political party mass membership could force force people's names onto the ballot paper, even if they're not popular with the party hierarchy, through either some uh, party processes or a primary election process of some kind, you'd then get those popular but not in with the party individuals onto the ballot paper, and they'd have a better chance of getting elected. That would be, in a sense, an analogous to the way we get independence up in our local divisions. Um, because so long as, and I mentioned this earlier, so long as the parties strictly control who gets nominated, they have power over the careers of those individuals. They, and two thirds of them will probably be the, the party hacks we like to denigrate because they're, they're over loyal to the party and they'll never do anything the public wants if the party hasn't decided to do it. Electoral reform by the Liberal Party of Canada, for example, um, where some order comes from on high to stop doing something that I, I think it's fair to say that quite a number of the, um, the Federal House of Commons members of the Liberal Party probably wanted to do something in electoral reform, but the whole game was cancelled. Um, control of the nomination process is incredibly important and it's a kind of, looks like a technical detail that lurks underneath the choice of electoral system, um, but don't take your eye off it. Control of nominations matters a lot. Right, Malcolm. So just to kind of jump in there, recently the Liberal Party of Canada decided that they are going to, um, that all of their incumbents will face no nomination contests. All, all 182 of them, there's no, if you want to run in one of those ridings, the, um, the Liberals have decided, you're, you're it. If you're the incumbent, you're it. There's no open nominations. How would well, that, how be, that, would that how be that different? <laughs> oh, but well, they, have a, they can do whatever they want. That's the, that's the point, right? So would that be any different in a proportional system? If you have a two or three parties in a coalition government, is there any more consequence for a party to do that? Is there any connection? Because that's something that, I, it's a theme. It's a theme that people don't like, this whole idea of power being concentrated at the top, power being backroom party hacks, this kind of thing. It's something that opponents throw at PR, but I see more of it with First Past the Post. Well, in First Past the Post or AV, um, the part and, and what you just described, the party nominates the individual, that's it. If you're a voter whose sentiment is to support the Liberal Party, there's only one candidate and you may hate them or not know them. Um, but you can, as I said, you can also bastardise any of the party, party list systems are already inherently controlled by party nominators. You can bastardise STV as we've done with the way we elect our Senate. And I think two thirds of the Australian Senate is essentially appointees of the political parties like a closed list system in, in outcome, even though it looks like STV. So they found a way by manipulating the design of the ballot paper and the options that voters have to, to give it that outcome effect. Tasmanian ACT systems, as I described earlier, are more of the pure original version where the voters have more control. Um, but what I was suggesting, uh, I described earlier that in Tasmania, each of the large parties nominated five candidates for the five member seats what if voters could add to that number and there were eight or nine or 10? So long as everyone marks all the preferences, that's not doing the party any harm in total, but it's giving people more choice. And the, the rebellious individual from the party who wanted to get nominated, but they got, you know, they're not, they're not sufficiently obedient to the party hierarchy can still get onto the ballot paper. Um, in, in British Columbia, if you choose an electoral system, you need also to have in mind how much the parties control the nominations of candidates. Yeah. Could it possibly be any worse than it is now? I'm sorry? Could it be worse than it is now? Like I No. No, no, no. no. It, right now is the worst it could possibly be. Okay. Thought we'd just get that out of the way, Shang. Yeah, here in, in Canada we our our Prime Minister has so much power. It's uh, it's un uh, unparalleled, I think, in, in Western democratic systems back in in holland the prime minister the premier they call him is a is considered a primus inter paris a first amongst equals uh, he doesn't hold the powers that that trudeau holds at all nowhere near uh, also at, uh, by the way trudeau our our feminist in chief of course with that 
uh, nomination law uh, has decided that three quarters of his candidate be candidates being men is totally acceptable. He wants to keep it that way. So not very good to, to get more women in parliament. In Holland, again, it's different because the parties do not have the same control. When you have so many parties, leaders simply don't have the same level of control. Members can walk over to another party or they can decide to run as independents or start their own party. There just isn't that amount of control. And uh, and this, that's, I can see that that is the big difference between Tasmania, Canada and uh, on one side hand and uh, Holland on the other side. It's just the fact that there's more political parties. It's harder to control when there's more choice and there are more parties. And now I'm, somebody also brought up about women and I know that both Tasmania and I'm pretty sure the Netherlands has a pretty high percentage of women elected. In so Holland, right in the parliament that currently there are 53 of the 150 are uh, only are women. Uh, the back Earth. few years back Earth. used to be used to be yeah was we were like 40 percent, uh, but yeah it's gone down to 35 percent or so. What is it now in Tasmania, Malcolm? Do you know? Well, I don't know? I don't know the numbers, and I haven't even glanced at the gender of the people elected 36 hours ago. Um, I think I think gender representation is reasonably good in Australia now. Um, it's much easier to achieve it in the proportional STV elected chambers than in the single member elected chambers. Um, the Labor Party is pretty good at making at getting close to 50-50. The Greens are pretty good at being close to 50-50. Uh, the Liberal Party and the National Party are less good, um, which contributes to the totals in the National Parliament. Uh, but it comes down to nominations. If you if you if you nominate one male, then that's you're not going to get a female in if the electorate supports that party. If you have an STV election like Tasmania and you nominate five candidates, you're probably going to nominate three and two of each gender. You might not, but um, you know, the more successful politicians might happen to be slightly more of one gender than the other. But at least it allows you to give the voters choice. The voters can then choose whatever they want. Um, the ACT, which also has 25 members, um, has, I think it has, it may have a majority of women at the moment. It's also got at least three gay people. Um, and I think it's the first time in Australia we've had a parliament where only a minority are straight males. So you know, multi-member systems give you far more options for representing by gender or sexuality or any other um, social categorization that you uh, you feel is underrepresented. The indigenous people is another, another situation. We've got a few in Australia's parliament at the moment for the first time I think we've got three or four indigenous people in the federal parliament. Mm -hmm. Either way both both Tasmania and Holland clearly are doing better than Canada. Canada is only 28 percent women uh, which yeah. is shameful which is somewhere yeah. somewhere uh, near the bottom of the top 100. I'm surprised. Countries. So I've got a couple more questions and these ones are I'm a little hesitant to ask because they're a little bit inside baseball. So you're going to have to give people the background of what this person's asking. Um, so for Sheng, um, the Green Left Party in Holland was offered a place in government, but they declined. And the person's wondering if you know anything about that or you could speak to that. Yeah, they were the, the logical choice to join government because they just gained a bunch of seats and that what tend to happen, parties which lose seats tend to not be asked to form, become part of the government and parties which run way up tend to be asked. Um, they negotiated, talked for a few weeks and then they found irreconcilable differences uh, with the other parties. The, the other parties tended, uh, the, the dominant parties are sort of center-right uh, and uh, the I think what eventually broke the, the negotiations apart was disagreement about immigration, about limiting immigration. The, uh, more conservative parties wanted more restrictions and the Green Party couldn't live with it. Um, and for you, Malcolm, somebody's asking about the Jackie, Jackie Lambie. Yep. Uh, so that's a very small party in Tasmania that didn't get enough votes to get a seat. Is that what happened? Yeah, if you're following Tasmania, um, the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, does really good e uh, election coverage. I recommend you to that website. I have a website myself. Um, just Google my name. Uh, Jackie Lambie was elected to the Senate 
about five years ago on the ticket of a minor party. That party got three senators elected and then the three of them split in different directions within um, months. It is quite common in Australia for small right of centre minor parties to get elected and within 12 months all of their members have fragmented into individual independence. Lambie served in the Senate for about four years and then she was caught up in this ridiculous business that we had last year of members um, finding that they had a foreign person as a grandfather and they were entitled to citizenship and therefore they were not entitled to be in Parliament. She got removed from the Senate and she's founded a small movement to run in northwest Tasmania um, to try and, you know, it, it's, it's what you might call regional populist. I don't, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Um, it's to some extent it's a rebellion against the Liberal Party's claims to represent rural people. She didn't do very well on Saturday. I think she only got about three or four percent, which is surprisingly low because she had a prominent individual profile. And I expect, because I think she's a He's a reasonably good retail grassroots politician. I suspect she'll run for the Senate again at the next election. Um, she'll need to get 14% of the vote, one seventh, because we elect six senators from each state. And I think I think she might be back in the Senate, um, but she didn't run for the Tasmanian House of Assembly on the weekend. She just lent her name to a suite of candidates. Uh, I think they ran in three of the five electorates. People thought they'd do well, they flopped. Right. So they got three or four percent of the vote. And I mean, that's the difference between, you know, an STV system and a party list system in Holland. She probably would have picked up a bunch of seats yeah, and then there would yeah. have been 14 parties. Yeah. Four or five <laughs> right. seats. Yeah. Same as the party for the other one. It's not enough in Australia. You're not going to get anywhere with that. You might have <laughs> um, other parties, but you won't get anywhere yourself. Okay, um, so I want to just address a couple more issues before we go because this is something we're hearing about quite a lot in BC. So I want to go back to the too complicated thing. And so Sheng put up a ballot and that was quite a big ballot. That was yeah. the kind of ballot that the opponents bring to the meetings and hold it up and say, <laughs> this is what we're going to get. And, you know, um, Malcolm, you know, with STV, you know, opponents, uh, you spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on advertising before the last referendum telling people that it was so complicated that you couldn't understand what to do with it. So from right. voters' perspective, it's really, they don't find these systems complicated at all in practice. Uh, in, in Australia, in Tasmania and the ACT, it's basically a landscape A4 page with four or five or six columns, perhaps a little wider in some of the ACT ones, um, and about 30 names. And most voters will approach that piece of paper knowing the names of half a dozen of the politicians on it, if perhaps they're already in office. Um, no one in Australia complains that this is difficult. It's not difficult. It's a bit of work for the counting staff next week who have to handle all the transfer of preferences under STV. The voters don't do that. No one in Australia ever complains that they are affected by the complexity of the process. They might think it's a bit odd that it takes two weeks to resolve the very last seat, but nothing worse than that. And as I argued earlier, they if you're using ranked choice voting for multi-member divisions, all you need to do is approach the situation by knowing a small number of candidates that you approve of and what order you prefer to put them in. And you don't have to worry about anything else to do with boundary divisions or tactical voting or all the other complexities that creep into single member systems. The claim that single member systems are not complicated because the task of filling out the ballot paper is easy is a rhetorical trick. It's concealing a whole lot of complexity behind that frankly untrue claim for simplicity. Absolutely. I, could, I couldn't agree more. In, in um, the Broadbent Institute did uh, some research after the 2015 election, the federal election in Canada. 46% of people did not vote for the party of their first choice. Now, talk about complicated. How do you figure out who to vote for? You know, how do you know who's ahead and who's behind and who has the best chance? And are they really? It's so difficult. In, in, and it, as, that's as, complication. It's also impossible. If you are in a close marginal electorate and you don't, you can't have information about who the best place two candidates will be. It is actually impossible to vote tactically for many people in Canada and the United Kingdom. In Australia, none of that applies because even our single member electorate systems using preferential voting don't have that worry. No, well, Tactical in, voting in, is impossibly complicated. 
Absolutely, and people are desperately to try to make this faulty system work for them. You know, they do want their vote to mean something, and I think yeah. that's why we, uh, why it's so common uh, to happen. We also want to say that the the uh, complication of the count uh, of certain systems is kind of a hoax too. Uh, yeah. In BC, we do absentee voting, which means that any voter can walk into any voting station in the province and vote. And that those votes don't get counted immediately because they have to check that the voter didn't vote twice. So those votes get sent around to their own districts, then it gets checked against the voters list to make sure that it's all honest. And then two weeks later, those votes get counted. Here in BC in the, this, the election this spring, we had to wait two weeks before we knew who could form the government because of one riding, a few hundred votes in one riding. How much more complicated does that get? And how, how ridiculous is that really when it's such a small minority can make such a huge difference? Um, okay, last thing I wanted to ask about is this whole idea that small parties will get to control the government. So this is something we're hearing about a lot. Um, you know, that the tail wags the dog and, you know, particularly Malcolm, you know, with the Green Party, right? So, I mean, just to bring it out in the open, right? The Green Party in BC has 17% of the vote. They only have three seats, but a lot yeah. of people still look at the Green Party as some kind of a fringe. And that's true in Tasmania as well. And I described that earlier that um, I think BC and Tasmania are similar in their political culture. BC is 10 times the population, but they, you know, there's some similar, similar resource and forestry and issues and so on. Um, if you if you desperately don't want the Green Party in power, then the worst thing that can happen is the Greens having the balance of power, as has happened in Tasmania three times and in BC now. Um, but hang on a minute. To what extent do you who oppose them have the right to bastardise the electoral system so that those Green voters don't get representation to achieve your goal? Um, that, that goal is illegitimate. Um, but I'd, I'd like to answer the question on a, in a different angle as well. This, this idea of balances of power being you know, in the hands of fringe people are difficult to exercise. I've seen examples of both. Um, it is certainly conceivable that a, an extreme party, one of the far right or far left, might have the balance of power. Um, what Germany's going through at the moment is a little bit analogous to that. In that case, it is the responsibility of all those who call themselves centrist governing parties to do what the Germans have done and what occasionally Australian major parties do and cooperate so as not to give that extremist power if your political judgment is that they're unacceptable. Um, at the same time, I've seen balance of power people, including the one I worked for 15 years ago, who sit in the political centre and who thoughtfully and carefully go about saying, I'm going with that group on this decision and that group on the other decision and I'll choose that one to be in government because they're more competent at the moment. Um, it is, it is not necessarily the case that just because you're the one person in the balance of power that you are an extremist. You could actually be helping balance the system, which would otherwise be lurching to the left or to the right um, without really having a public mandate to do that. Cheng, do you want to uh, comment on yeah, that? On yeah, with, the, with the multi-party system, there's no, no one party which holds the reins or which can force other parties to do anything. It, uh, when you have so many, so many, when you have four different parties in, in government, plus a parliament which has a mind of its own, uh, then nobody, nobody holds the balance of power. There's no such thing as the balance of power. It just doesn't exist. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's, a, that's such a different story than what we, um, we're hearing pretty much on a daily basis here. So I guess that'd be as we sign off, any um, thoughts, Malcolm and Sheng, for what we're looking at ahead? So Malcolm, we may be having a referendum in PEI, possibly within a few months. Um, since the PEI government didn't like the results of the first one, they decided they wouldn't implement that and they would set it up so that they would have another kick at the can to kill it. And then in November here in, um, in, British, in British Columbia, referendum we don't know yet what the ballot will be but we're expecting to know within probably the next month or so and then our federal election is um only oh, a little less than two years away and the our ndp has said they will not support a minority government unless uh there's a condition of pr so it's very much alive and well in canada and i'd like your thoughts on what we can do going forward to give us the best chance of success 
keep doing what you're doing. Grassroots support is where it will be won and lost. Um, marshalling the best arguments about complexity or the goals of representation and so on. I think you're, from what I, I'm seeing as an observer watching what's happening in Canada, you're doing all the right things. You just need to force the politicians to bring these matters to decision making. I'm not even sure that referenda are necessary. You should just legislate to do these things because good voting is a human right. Um, but anyway, if you have to go through a referendum process, I personally think, and I'm watching the United Kingdom, the United States and Canada, um, that Canada will be where reform happens next. Um, the Brits have fallen behind, despite some good efforts going on there. Um, I'm struck by the m movement for what they call ranked choice voting in the United States, which is essentially preferential voting. Um, I hope they move to a system, it would be STV, what they're really talking about. But I think the Canadian provinces are where the reform is happening next. Don't slow down. All right, Sheng, any thoughts? Well, I just wanted to go back to Wilders and the extremists and to say that you now while the whole world was seemed to be upset and was watching Holland, this Wilders, Wilders was going to take over. The Dutch themselves were not worried at all. They they know him uh, and they knew that he was not going to get anywhere near the reins of power. And I think uh, the same goes for so many of the arguments that the opposition they have, a, have a knack of using what's wrong with uh, first past the post and then saying that's what will happen when you get PR. And it's nonsense, of course. So I think we just have to keep on arguing. We just have to keep on uh, 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 organizing at the grassroots, get ready and get out our vote and, and fingers crossed, hope to win it this time. Okay, so I'll end with the pitch to get involved, folks. <laughs> so go to our website, fairvote.ca, um, connect with us, ask how you can get active in your local community, sign up to send us a, a monthly donation. That's what keeps us going. It's been keeping us going for 17 years now that we've been fighting these battles. Um, we still believe in this. We think we're going to win and we need everyone's support because there's nobody else that does it except for the people that are watching this webinar. There's nobody else that funds us except the people that are watching this webinar. So we need you. We're all one big team and we are, our next opportunities are literally months away. So thanks everyone for tuning in and thank you to our special guests. And this uh, will be up on YouTube hopefully by tomorrow night and you can invite your friends to watch. Thanks. Night, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Night.